Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. This is our special weekend edition where we take a look at the stock, crypto and commodity market right now for the week ahead and the key levels that you need to be looking at. We had a Friday session that was showing sell off across the board and while the jobs numbers came out well for the US, there's so many economic indicators that are starting to look like recessionary picks. So what are we going to be doing for the week ahead? Stay tuned as we break it down for you right now. See you soon. So welcome back and this is our market recap for the markets closed 4th of March 2022 and of course our week ahead look at stock, crypto and commodities markets. If you like any of those, make sure you smash that subscribe button and of course hit the like if you find value in the video. So the jobs report on the surface looks pretty good, 678,000 jobs, 3.8% unemployment rate and really any of the metrics you're looking at, they're starting to improve and this is important because if jobs are of course declining, that is a big deal and the market hates that. But the market's looking ahead right now and I think this is where the problems are. It's not so much the number that we've currently got, it's what they're predicting in the future. Remember the markets think 12 to 18 months ahead of what everybody else is thinking. That's why sometimes they don't make sense. So what happened on the Friday session? Let's try to understand and break it down before we get into some macro stuff and of course our technical analysis key levels for the week. Straight away here, you'll see it was a sell-off in the financials, a sell-off in the semiconductors, and really a hit to all of growth. So growth was getting hit, but some of the other parts of the market, the more defensive parts, did a lot better. In terms of which market performed poorly, it was pretty much the NASDAQ that did the worst with IWM, the small caps, and the technology. And the market sold off initially, rallied, and then sold off again. And a little bit of a pickup into the close. Not too much to write home about there. If we think about the sectors that were doing well, the reason why the S&P 500 did okay was because we had gold miners, we had energy, we had materials and minerals, and of course we had things like utilities and defensives really being stacked into. This shows us that Wall Street is moving into two different markets. A market where they've got defensive plays and a market where they're selling off all of these growth style stocks into massive concerns in this economy. Let's just take a step back again though and think about where we're at in the markets because whenever we're feeling fear, we've got to understand, do we have two different scenarios? Do we have a buying condition where maybe we start to nibble on positions for our longer term portfolios or do we have just a sell off across the board? And we're starting to reach that period of what you would call almost peak fear. So we're getting close to that point. So PE ratio has actually improved in recent months since this sell off quite a lot. We're back down to 24.68. This isn't Ford PE, this is current PE. And you'll notice that was right around those kind of peaks previously to when they started putting the obviously Benaki put in or the Greenspan put as we call it and all of those other you know big monetary policy things that happen in the markets. But 24.68, a little bit more reasonable than where it was a while ago. If we also think about what's been going on with the economy, the problem of all those stimulus checks, they've come out of the market. So personal savings as a percentage of disposable personal income in the US has actually gone back down, if not gone lower than where it was previously before all of this pandemic. And that kind of shows you that all that sugar rush in consumer discretionary is coming out. People have obviously consumed, people have spent their money, and they're going back into not having a great level of savings. We've also got consumer price index obviously going up huge. And this is what everybody's looking at at the moment. Inflation is here. And on top of inflation being here, people are going to buy less because they have to tighten up. Why is why are we seeing everybody buying minerals and buying the, the consumer staples and utilities? Because they're our bare essentials. That's what you have to have. So as this consumer price index probably continues to spike over the next couple of months, that's what Wall Street is backing into at this stage. So we spoke about this a few times now. And really, these are the key things that you need to really just cut out the noise and say, okay, have we hit these inflection points yet? One of those is the historical 10 minus 2 spread in terms of treasury yields. When these invert, bad things happen. I always call it the canary in the coal mine because remember, they used to send the canary down to figure out whether it was poisonous down there or not. And right now, we're not quite seeing it, but you will see that the 10-year versus 2-year is dropping. Look at it go. And if it gets to these points, it has usually been an incredibly good canary at picking problems in the market 
where you might want to deleverage or at least consider your next one to two years worth of moves. This tends to be a very early indicator and I want to res uh, really respect it as a very early indicator because a lot of people think, oh, it's happened, I'm going to sell straight away. It can happen and it can take up to two years for it to turn around. It's more of a, you understand that there is something incredibly wrong with the economy more so than ever before. Another big stat that people are starting to bring in here, and this comes from our public Discord community. So thank you so much for sharing that. Join in the links down below and make sure you get involved with the community. It's great. We're up to, I think, almost 7,000 members now in there, which is fantastic. And oil price spikes have often really precursed recessionary kind of thing. So we've got another key lead indicator here showing us that when oil spikes hard, it has tended to lead into recessions or into bad periods of the market. And that's certainly what a lot of rich people are starting to do. There's a lot of Euro USD FX panic. And I'll explain that on a chart a little bit later. But these are this is where we've got this big disconnect. We've got employment obviously improving. Obviously underemployment still a big issue. But at the same time, we have so many indicators saying, okay, there's weakness here. There's problems here. Uh, what are we going to do? So we'll try to cut through that today and get a bit of an idea of a game plan for the next couple of months on what key levels you might want to be looking at. And of course, the next week ahead. So this is actually something that comes from one of the members of the community. And I asked them, you know, underneath the 50 exponential moving average, that is the weekly, what ends up happening? So if we took the candle leading into the close, and then we worked out the percentage drop after that, we can get a bit of an idea on what the average drop is after we get down under this key indicator. And actually the average turns out to be about 14.85%. So that is that including the candle that, that creates the drop under the 50, further weakness does send or come through. And I think that's another nice stat that happens there. In terms of PE ratios, just remember our forward PE is sitting around 19.2. The market becomes, let's call it relatively cheap when you get back into that 16, 17 PE. So if this was to occur, I think the prediction would really be around that 3,800 on the S&P. If that happened, would you be in an amazing time to potentially be adding huge levels to your investment portfolio? Yeah, of course. If that happened, by the averages, by the stats, by, of course, if the unemployment still stays similar, it could be a very good time. So that hasn't happened yet. Remember, all historical corrections taken into consideration without a recession, generally negative 15, negative 20, you start entering a bear market, you don't want it underneath that. And of course, that would be sitting on that 3,800. We've discussed it many times before. So if you haven't already got this, US 02Y minus US 10-year, that will give you your point here for inversion. And if you get this one, this is the most important one to invert. A lot of people have been saying, but Tom, what about the US 20-year minus the US 30-year or however ratio you want to do it? Hasn't that been inverted for a while? It has. And for many people, this was the canary for the current sell-off, but this one isn't as good a lead indicator to a full economic recession as the US 2 versus 10. Now we've discussed before the flight to safe haven. So we obviously have you know an invasion going on in the world right now and people are starting to freak out. One of the best places for you to really spot the fact that rich people are bailing on some of the economy has got to be the Euro Swiss. You know, when you think about it, if their euro is weakening against the Swiss, what's happening? They're putting money into the Swiss banks. And this is where we know a lot of rich people are. And this is tends to be the type of thing that happens. Look at the recession here in 2008, 2009. And look what happened to the euro Swiss. It went down considerably until the bank stepped in. And this is an important point. The bank sometimes steps in here to try to support it. And then they had to let it go. I still remember that day. One of the best days to study on why you've always got to be prepared for crazy situations and generally don't trade pegged markets because that was wild. It actually went even worse than what it shows here if you were there for the trading session. Shout out to anyone that did trade or was around during this period. It was crazy, I can tell you that. So they're dumping money into the Swiss banks. Basically, they're saying, you know what? I'm scared. Let's get out of here. We're going through. And this is really putting pressure on this. And I think the bank will try to intervene at some point in the future. They do have a tendency to do that. But it shows you the true fear that's going out there, even in the richer side in terms of the bigger players in the markets. 
The VIX here, 32 leading in, pretty high volatility. I would got to say that it's still continued to really manage itself here with a big one. Long leg doji, high, low, open, close. It's not telling us too much about the week ahead. So the VIX, still high, still be nimble, still be fast in the markets. That's really the way we look at it. The PCC put call ratio still hovering in the middle of our two kind of oscillator ranges. Kind of shows there's a good balance between the amount of puts and calls being entered into the system. It doesn't give us too much knowledge for the week ahead. But where we are starting to see some knowledge is, of course, gold. And if anyone took these trades last week, we obviously had the good trade off 1922, certainly a level that we liked a lot to the bull side, series of higher lows coming in, and then a nice 1950 break getting us to a 1970 closure. So let's have a look at this on a weekly because it's starting to look like it wants to keep going. I mean, look at this. This is all the 1960s, which is why we had that take profit target around those levels. Gold now sitting at 1970. If it breaches past this wick, what's next in store for gold? Well, obviously 2000 is going to be a key level to a degree, but really it's kind of pointing towards possibly all time highs on gold. And it's been a disappointing metal compared to the minerals. If you've been in things like we discussed a few weeks ago, palladium up 23, 24%. If you've been in oil, even though I think that's an incredibly risky trade both ways at the moment, just because of the volatility, that's been up huge. And then you've got things like wheat even crazier in terms of percentages. So there's a lot of huge mineral moves. And I would like to caution people, be careful in these moves. Some of these ones become incredibly large and you can't necessarily predict the top on some of these moves. So US oil sitting here at 116, back at a resistance. I'm sure some people are trying to sell it off this area. And the reason why is it's back at the resistance. They have a tight stop loss, but you've probably got to have a stop loss. Otherwise things can get really out of control against you. And look, it, it's it's there, but let's put this in perspective of weekly just to get an idea of how big this candle is. There it is. Whoa, it's big. It's really big. And this is going to come back to be a really huge pain on economies. I mean, what does this mean? Fuel prices are going up, costs are going up again. You know, your car, manufacturing because of minerals, everything is going up. Like you, you'll go into a car, I'm pretty sure of this, you'll go in and try to order a car in two to three months time as it all goes through the systems and everything is going to be way more expensive. You know, th that's how it works. I mean, if this stuff's up, it's going to really hurt retail traders and of course retail just in general like we are going to see a big hit on dis di disposable cash which is going to affect consumer discretionary at least i would think it will and i'm not bullish on that sector because of many of these things that we've seen going on here so yeah us oil it's it's at 116 and that is historically very very high you break it through the last level it ever got to is 146 and we saw before on that chart that if this continues to go parabolic, it's another really big sign that we could be going into a recession in only you know one to two years, if not already starting to go into it. So we've got to be very, very careful there. Tesla, we've talked about this stock all the time. It held amazingly well. And I have, you know, I've said this before. I feel like the high oil price is going to lead the consumer to instead of buying, let's say, a traditional normal kind of petrol car, they'll be going towards electric and Tesla's seen as the winner here for that. Now, you might say, but, but Tom, I don't think that's how it is. If you couldn't afford the petrol, you've got no ability to buy the car. It's the way people think. People do think like this, like, oh, I should go a hybrid. I should go, you know, an electric car. It's just the way it is. I mean, look here in Australia, the RAV4, which is a popular car, Toyota car, the hybrid engine is sold out like 18 months in front. And that's because people were moving already to this idea that they didn't want to spend money. That They don't do the calculation, you know what I mean? They just think it. <laughs> and if someone thinks something, it's a very powerful tool. So we have here the support that's formed through the 828, 820 kind of seven level for Tesla. If you're feeling bullish on the next week, let's have a look at this in general. Let's go to the daily here. Yep, it's uh, not telling us too much on the daily. So not that good, four hour. Okay, so four hours got some little bounces. So we've got this 827 support. You close underneath here, obviously next stop 800 for the day traders. If you get back above 890, and if you get back above 890, 945. That's kind of the levels that I'm thinking of. I'm gonna like Tesla for the day trade for the week ahead. If we see bounces, you can already see the resilience of the stock since oil's gone crazy. It's been more resilient and it's bounced off that 700 and people are probably pretty happy with themselves that have got it down here. 
and feeling relatively confident. But yeah, it's got some good levels. So we've got that eight kind of 60, breach above, go to the 880, 890, kind of 900 level. You get above that, 945, you get below this, 800 first stop, underneath 800, we got problems. Then we could be looking at 700 again, which is where we've targeted. Let's move over to RK. Look, I'm not gonna mention much about this other than it shows why you shouldn't be too crazy when it comes to being bullish here on the longer term investments. It hasn't broken its downward trend. It hasn't broken the 20 moving average. It's, it's you know, not strong. And that's what we've seen consistently. Let's talk about sectors in the market. So we know that it's been a disconnect in the markets recently. That is that energy, financials, MU, agriculture, some of these minerals, all of these things have held up amazingly as tech has been belted down. And now we're starting to see financials turn. Now, this is because the US 10-year and two-year are obviously dropping, which is putting you know, more pressure on the financial institutes because they don't mind rates going up to a degree. And it's really showing kind of the health of the economy. So see here, we have a support. Now, if XLF doesn't hold, what's going to happen? Possibly a sell-off in the financials here in the US. So be very careful. In Europe, they are selling off hard. In even Australia, they're selling off. In America, they're selling but they haven't moved through the key support just yet. So continue to watch this space in terms of the financials, something that I'll be looking at for the week ahead. Now we mentioned Europe, let's go over there because I'm seeing this as the bit of the lead of the problems that are going on in the markets. We've talked about the DAX now for two weeks straight. We talked about this level being a massive short. And if you were feeling bearish on markets, you gotta remember, you gotta pick your strong ones versus your weak ones. We all like to trade the American market, but if you were shorting the DAX, instead of the American market at the same time, look how much you're up. You're up 12.83% to the downside, or let's say 11% at close. It's a huge amount. In comparison, you're probably only up 2% on the, on the US market. So the DAX has been actually the better short, and you've got to always realize what is the best one to trade. Always think of that comparison. If you think about uh, you know putting here SPX versus uh, DE40, what you'll notice is look at this. It's an incredible bullish scenario here in terms of if you bought this kind of spread, look at that, look at the percentage. It's phenomenal. Start thinking about markets a little bit this way. 17% relative performance if you'd shorted the DAX and longed the S&P. Wow, yeah, probably mind blown over some of those things. So it's all about, this is what big investors do. They think about this. This is the long short kind of society of what a hedge fund considers. And when you start to get into that play and you think outside big brain on it, you can do very, very well there. US 30, here we are. Here we have a very, very nice kind of weakness going through. Obviously, it's a Wyckoff kind of scenario here. But good news for bulls, it didn't get underneath. We created a low, a high, a low, an open and a close and a long leg doji, effectively indecision on our, our Dow here. If it breaks through here, I think we've got to be bullish on the market. And at this point, you have to have almost no opinion. You have to be okay. I'm prepared to go either way, but I want the market to tell me what's going on. We didn't get a break underneath this 33,000. That's unfortunate if you're a bear because it didn't really kind of commit. And I think this is because tons of money is going out of the euro out of all of those places and effectively it's coming into what they consider a safe haven, which is in this stage, it looks like the Australian market and the American market are being considered partial safe havens here against all of the uncertainty in the world. IWM continues to be, you know, really all over the place. It doesn't tell us much about the market. We do know that if we get past 210, we'd expect the DAX to be doing, I mean, the Dow to be doing the same right thing. So that would be the double bottom, good bullish strength at this stage. IWM, the small caps, not doing so well. NASDAQ, now this is where things get a little bit interesting for the week ahead. Look at this support, everyone. Bang, bang, bang on the Friday session. Breach below, what does it expose? 13K or around 13K, 13.50. So this is a huge thing for the week ahead. You close below this low, what have you done? You've solidified further weakness. There is literally no support here. There has been no support. I mean, maybe you could argue 13.5, maybe. But even then, very nice shorts if you're looking at it. If you're thinking long, of course, you get through here. The big problem you've got is instantly you go into this zone. And we, we've been talking a lot about the daily here. 
And this downward trend continues to hold up. You know, the NASDAQ continues to really show that it can't get through this daily 20 moving average, the red line here. It's consolidating at this zone. And I think if you're feeling bullish on the market, you need it above 14.4. 14.4 plus bang, let's go. You know, next stop 15.2 probably here. But at this stage, very, very weak. And let's move over to the S&P 500 before we... Actually, we'll talk bonds first. Let's talk bonds. So the bonds here, this is the corporate bonds. They're continuing to tell us the market doesn't know what the hell it's doing. So the bonds are saying, hey, you know, well, we're not very... Con well, we're a bit concerned about the market. We don't feel positive. But if you see the bonds turn and the market turn at the same time, it could be a good signal the bottom's in. So just watch the bonds. This is VCIT. It's one of the ones I use. I use a few different ones. Obviously, if you're interested in learning more about bonds, metals, I'd suggest you do the private mentoring we offer, but it's up to you. And yeah, the bond market here, certainly still weakening. And if you put that on a weekly, you can see the bond market was kind of predicting that there was something horrible going on back in December of the US market. So that was saying, no, 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 I'm not happy about this. Something you can start to bring into your analysis. Let's move over to the S&P 500. So we've been talking a lot about the weekly 50 exponential. We ended up getting a high, low, open close in terms of long leg doji. Good thing is it gives us the sell points. It gives us the buy points for the week ahead. Breach above, bang, let's go buy. Breach below, okay, cool, we're shorting. We have to remain indifferent here in the markets. There's so many indicators saying bearish and a few indicators saying bullish. It's it's a really fearful time and, and therefore we have to really just take out our opinion and say, okay, if price action gets under this level, what are we looking for in our system? We could be certainly looking towards the short side. And if that happens, you know, what becomes the price action way? And, and you know, we're still here Whereas if we delete all of this stuff, we get rid of all this rubbish here, you know, and we just think about it from a technical perspective. This is still a left shoulder, head, right shoulder. So if you get through this neckline, what happens? We move to what you would think is the distance. And remember before we talked about the average close, once it closes underneath the 50 exponential moving average, that is including this candle here of the close, it moves around 15 or 14, 15% on average. Now that's what that's what it can do. This would be another 11% down. It would hit the 3,800 and that would be a very cool bear case scenario. So there are both bear and bull cases here. From the surface, you would think it's only bear and I totally understand why, but the price action will tell us what's going on. And I've really got to stress that it's difficult in these times to really get bullish and it's difficult to sometimes, you know, know when to get back in. But the markets will generally tell you with some good price action. And you have to just kind of cut out the news, cut out the crap. How many times have you missed lows over the last decade in trading where you go, oh, I wish I bought it. It was so obvious. Well, the problem is, is that you had a bias that was caused by it. And sometimes, look, you know, right now I'm seeing these charts and I'm probably negatively biased. But if it goes bullish, I'll have to flick the switch. There's nothing you can do about it. It is what it is. BTC here, yes, that looks kind of bearish. The 44,000 or 44,000, 45,000 continued to maintain kind of the peak. It's sold off. It's gotten through the 45. So the 40,500 were on the weekend here in terms of trade. Shorts have really risen in BTC recently in terms of the contracts, the futures contracts. And next stop could very well be 34,000 here for this one. So we're kind of around the zone where you expect maybe some buyers, but really if they don't come in here and it gets underneath this low, you kind of got to start thinking about 34 or even 30K. Be careful here with Bitcoin. It's showing us that there's a weakness across the board. It doesn't look too good. Week ahead news, uh, there's quite a lot of news coming out. I think even the ECB press conference becomes important at the moment because of all the things that are going on. So we've got Thursday, March 10th, we've got core CPI, CPI coming out, we've got the ECB press conference, oh yay, lots of more information to really hurt us here. And then of course we have prelim UOM consumer sentiment and the Australian uh, Governor Lowe will speak. I don't think that'll move the markets too much though. So a lot of things, jolts, job openings, all of these bits of information coming out and you need to be aware of those. Also remember, please do follow us over at FX Evolution in terms of Twitter. We're posting there quite a lot. And if you have any questions, you can always post them in our Discord room as well. Remember, subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Have a great weekend and smash that like button. Bye for now.